I first heard about Laura when after she'd purchased the book, she'd written a letter which had actually, and I remember the letter now, where she asked about, this, specifically about what we call the Swiss option. I wasn't clear whether she was quite certain about whether she wanted to do this because very few Australians really want to come this far and so in right around the world. To, most people say clearly, I'd rather die in my own home. But as it turned out, she certainly saw no significant reason for not taking this step. And there was lots of things about the Swiss option which do have an appeal. You know you will get the best drugs. You know that there's no illegal legal issues associated with it. And you don't have to try to become some latter-day 80-year-old drug dealer by bringing drugs into a country like Australia. So it's a lawful option. There's no question about people being with you. You don't have to run around worrying about a dozen police looking at, looking at whether or not you were assisted because you can clearly be lawfully assisted in this country. So there's a lot of appealing aspects to it which clearly struck a chord. In Australia, we're seeing changes to the laws finally taking place after this long period from when the Northern Territory law, the world's first, came in and went away. Now we're starting to see laws come in. And, of course, politicians are being asked to draft and formulate these particular pieces of legislation. Laura comes along with a particular set of circumstances. She's certainly not a terminally ill person. In fact, she's been quite clear in saying that she's not a person who would even see herself as a sick person. She certainly wouldn't qualify for any of these new, newly constructed pieces of legislation. She wouldn't satisfy the Victorian law even close the models we've seen that are coming in in Victoria, then Western Australia and soon in Queensland, we imagine, are simply not really addressing the real issues of people that are ageing. But the broader context in the international scene is, of course, that this is the cutting edge of the right to die movement. This is her right. She shouldn't have to come along and beg and grovel and try and pass some sort of rather macabre medical exam to qualify to die. She's saying this is fundamental. People will see her case and identify with her and say, yes, I can see what she's saying and I want that too. Exit International was set up with the overturning of the Northern Territory law. People kept coming to me after the law had gone didn't stop people wanting choice and so they would come along and say what can we do and so to try and make that information available by running these workshops we set up a, a structure and it was Exit International. We have membership all over the world. Most of our members are in North America really. We see people a lot who have got sometimes social reasons for wanting to die, not all medical and not all sickness, not all suffering, sometimes very clear social reasons. But if it's a rational and informed decision, we would say, I would say, yes, here's the information you need. The published information caused trouble. The book was banned. It became the only book banned, Australian published book banned in the last 50 years, which is quite, we're quite proud of in a way. People say, oh, you're making suicide too, ap too appealing and too attractive. In some ways, by talking about drugs at work and are peaceful, you're somehow or other making it more available. There's a quaint notion that the only reason people are alive is because they haven't learned how to die. And you go out there and tell them how to die, hell, I want to do it. It underpins government policy here that don't talk about how to do it. Ban the book. Don't let people know how to do it because if they know how to do it, they'll do it. It seems to be predicated on the idea the only reason any of us are alive is because we haven't worked out how to die. People should be over 50 so that they've had life experience, they're better able to assess the permanence of death. So we say, well, all right, if you're over 50 and you're of sound mind, this other rather nebulous quality of so-called mental capacity, then of course you should have the best information. I would argue you should have access to the best drugs. And we just see it over and over that when people get the drugs, they've got access to them, they can put them in the cupboard, lock them away, they've got a shelf life of 25 years, they know they've got this option should they need it stitched up and it's incredibly reassuring to people. You can see the anxiety and worry drain out of their faces. When people have this safety net in place, they stop worrying, they get on with it. And we would argue that having access to those drugs actually extends life because people are less inclined to act precipitously.